Hello, and welcome to Warhammer 40K's Grim History from Beyond. I am Zekthar. And I am Yuxin. We are the chroniclers of all that was, and all that will be in the 41st millennium. We've seen the rise and fall of many empires, and this week, we will be looking to everyone's favorite greenskins, the Orcs. Indeed, Zekthar, the Orcs, who love nothing more than a good scrap and some good old-fashioned crumpet. Join us this month as we discuss the biology of the orcoid species, their effect on the other species, some funny stories, and of course, notable characters. Of course, you see. But to our dear listeners, if you like our stuff, please subscribe, follow, like, and comment. And if you wish to help Bob, you can click the support podcast button on any of our descriptions on Spotify. Quite right, Zekthar. If you like what we do, don't hesitate to plug in on Spotify. We wish to keep this free and without ads, so if you find folks truly enjoy this, you can help. If you only donate to Bob on our Spotify channel for 99 cents a month, we can continue doing our stuff without those hated ads. Now, mind you, if you wish to do more, feel free. But this is all we ask, just 99 cents. Well, Zektar, let's get into it, shall we? Well, you, we will be discussing today... <clears throat> The War of the Beast. That is one of my favorite stories. But do you think we can do it in an hour? Nope. (laughs) Fair enough. Well, let's start with why this whole thing got started. Yes, but beware, dear listeners. This is one for the ages. While it might run long, I hope you enjoy The War of the Beast. Okay, so, by mid-M32, the Imperium was in a state of relative peace and prosperity, having recovered from the devastating Horus Heresy. The Traitor Legions were still railing from their defeat inside the Eye of Terror, and the Xenos were relegated to the frontiers of the Imperial space. And the stagnation and decay that would define the Imperium millennia later had not yet set in. Because of this relative peace, the High Lords began to slack off, sending the Imperial Navy to cover the borders of the Empire. Unfortunately, they had forgotten about the Orcs. This underestimation of the Greenskin threat would ultimately prove disastrous. What would become known as the War of the Beast began on the world of Artemantua in the Segmentum Solar during a routine action against another Xeno species known as the Chromes. The entire shield company of the Imperial Fist chapter had been sent to Artemantua to eliminate this insectoid threat. It was a normal part of Imperial military operations in the centuries after the heresy to eradicate such minor threats to the Imperial holdings near the Terran core worlds. Strategic surveys put the Chrome's numbers at something in the order of 88 billion. More importantly, scans had indicated that the Chrome's were in the midst of a great migration, as if they were fleeing something. Their path indicated that they would pass through the core worlds of the Segmentum Solar. This migration had to be stopped before the Xenos became a threat to the throne world itself. Artemantua was suddenly wracked by unexpected gravitational storms and geological disturbances as the Chromes made their final desperate assault upon the Imperial lines. The Imperial Fist contingent on the world was decimated, their fleet lost, and Chapter Master Cassus Murhead himself was slain by the Chromes. The High Lords of Terra, realizing that the disaster now faced Terra itself, if the Insectoids continued their desperate flight, ordered the deployment of a rescue mission led by the Lord Commander Militant of the Astro Militarum Heth and the entire Imperial Fist chapter to Artemantua. This course was particularly endorsed by the Grand Master of Assassins, Draken Vangoric. The source of the gravitational disturbances on Artemantua soon became clear when a massive planetoid, an orc attack moon, suddenly materialized in orbit above the world, proceeded to attack the Imperial rescue fleet. Below on the surface of Artemantua, the entire Imperial Fist chapter deployed under the command of First Captain Algorin, 
Second Captain Corland and Captain Sabar, alongside a handful of Imperial Guardsmen. They soon waged the desperate fight for survival against the panic-stricken chromes and escalating gra gravitic anomalies. The anomalies were caused by the green-skinned planetoid, which continued to phase in and out of real space as it drew closer to the final achieving full materialization from another dimensional realm the Imperials would later dub subspace. It was then that orc troops of massive size began to make planetfall and slew the remaining Imperial forces in the panicked hordes of the Chromes. Only one Imperial fist remained in the galaxy, Second Captain Corland of the Daylight Wall Company, who now found himself the de facto chapter master. After transmitting a final astropathic message to Terra that the Imperium faced a threat like none mankind had known before, Lord Commander Militant Hath's fleet was destroyed by the attack moon. Imperial strategos determined that the attack moon's next likely target was Terra itself. Um, real quick, what happened to Corland? Well, High Marshal Bohemond of the Black Templars chapter undertook a quest to help reunite the scattered successor chapters that hailed from the lineage of Rogold Orn. Corland, now known as the last son of Dor, took part in this clandestine meeting between several of their fellow scions of Dorne in the fall system, which included representatives from the Black Templars, Crimson Fist, Excoriators, and Fist's Exemplar. As the sole remaining Imperial Fist representative, Corland invoked the Last Wall Protocol a contingency established by Rogaldorn himself that was only to be enacted in the event Terra was under grave threat or perhaps had even fallen. Then all the successor chapters of the Imperial Fist Legion would come together to deal with the matter as one. Even if the Imperial Fist chapter itself were to be destroyed, the other successor chapters of the old 7th Legion would assume its duties. The Iron Knights would also respond to this call to arms, while the Soul Drinkers chapter could not be contacted. Probably because they were dealing with chaos. Or <laughs> their dealings with chaos. But, oh yeah, right. No, no, they didn't do that, right? Maybe? No. <laughs> well, um, real quick before we kind of get really rolling into the mess of the War of the Beast, I figured anyways we should probably talk a little bit anyways about how this whole disaster kind of came into being. I mean, as you kind of mentioned anyways, uh, this is ironically a short time anyways before the war of the beast they had kind of this short time of peace well and, i think there's multiple factors one of them is uh i think one of the things that would have helped them prepare for this is if the xenos ordos had actually existed xenos ordos is one of three branches of the inquisition right and, and it was it's the only one that's really been focused on studying xenos particularly right. well and if i recall right anyways at the end anyways of the war of the beast they they figured out that they needed they needed something that did that they, they needed studied, three you know. separate branches right and and this happened to be one of them yeah uh, as opposed to just being one giant conglomerate that just quite frankly is a miserable system but you won't and go then another thing that i think also helps cause this great havoc is one of the things that ended up happening maybe is a effect because of how many space marines were lost during the horus heresy and all that that happened but all that land that they had gained all the space land whatever you want to call it that Planets. they had gained mm -hmm. the forces to be able to stretch across that area was extremely thin because they didn't have nearly as much of a military force well okay no, it, so. no by this point anyways okay so this this takes place actually pretty far after the horus heresy because there there is a time and period anyways that i've actually been talking about in my many boxes called the great scouring that took place anyways in between there and now and it also anyways if i recall right anyways um this takes place okay so let me i can't remember actually now i think about it the first Black Crusade had already taken place, right? Um, I am not sure about that. 
Well, okay. So this took place in the mid M32, right? Right. So, uh, Stall, you said, I'll, I'll look it up here real quick. Let me grab my tomes. So it's been re- briefly about 10,000 years after the Horus Heresy, somewhere around there, right? No, 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 no. No. The Horus Heresy ended, I believe, anyways, towards the end of the 31st millennium. Towards the, so it's only been about 1,000 years then. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's... it. Yeah. Okay, so, so the first Black Crusade of Ezekiel Abaddon began with the first battle of Cadia in 781.m31. So this is so this is actually after Okay, let's face it though, in comparison to the armed forces that they had before the Horus Heresy, they had significantly less. I you know, I, I don't know because if that's they're true. now missing several legions. <laughs> well, okay, okay. They originally I, had uh, on top of way. that, they lost people during the infighting between the different chapters. Yeah, but at the same time, anyways, they began to repopulate them. And we are talking about it anyways, because if this did take place anyways after the uh, um, first Black Crusade, because this takes place in the mid-32nd millennium, correct? Yes. So I'll, I'll, give you, I'll give you the point anyways that, yes, there are less space marines now than there were during the Great Crusade. You're, miss, you're missing a few chapters or legions in there. What? <laughs> I don't. I don't necessarily think, anyways, that it, it's the fact, anyways, that they were spread way too thin. I think it's. It has more to do with the fact that they uh, have grown comfortable, and the fact that there was all this peace. Well, I think it's a bit of both because, like they say, one of the things that they did is okay. Now we're going to expand our forces out there to extend across our boundaries, which is one of the things that made their forces much thinner because they had to extend it all the way out there. The fact of the matter is, it's kind of like, for example, if you advance too far forwards, your forces, military forces, weaken significantly, and then somebody can just sweep in and basically take everything out. But from what I gathered, though, it seemed like they were just... To back it up. It seems to me anyways that they were actually just guarding their, uh, they weren't like, it wasn't like they're pushing out on their borders. It seemed like they were just protecting their borders. I I know, which should tell you something. Which to me anyways, tells me anyways that they had grown comfortable anyways with this concept of peace. They're like, almost kind of like in Terran 42, uh, Hadrian, Emperor Hadrian, you know who I'm talking about? No. Uh, Hadrian's Wall in Great Britain. But anyways, <laughs> Hadrian came up with the concept anyways that expanding the Roman Empire past the point that they were at that point anyways was a futile effort. So he just started building, bo- he started building, like, for instance, Hadrian's Wall. He started building his borders anyways around where it was at that time. And it kind of remained that way anyways for pretty much most of the rest of the Roman Empire until it split in two. Well, actually, no, until uh, Constantine. Regardless, <laughs> if we go too far into this, anyways, we'll start talking about the Romans instead of the orcs. But <laughs> my um, point is, though, is that at that point he established, yeah, if I went further, but this is kind of going in reverse of that because they had this land. It's like, okay, we have enough forces, all of a sudden, they don't have as much forces as they used to, to be able to cover that ground. Well, no, they, they'd, by this point, anyways, they'd already gone through the Great Scouring, so they'd already pushed everything back. They'd retaken all their stuff. But regardless, we're <laughs> I think we're going into uh, semantics here anyways. Although it is kind of an interesting conversation of why this kind of took into place. But we can both agree on the fact, anyways, that the, the Empire at this point, anyways, was nowhere near prepared for the massive onslaught that was about to hit them. Right? Right. I mean, they just there, there, there was, there was this thought, anyways, that the orcs were done for, and any time that they kind of popped up, it was just kind of like, well, they're just kind of a, more of a nuisance than anything else. Because but, uh, nobody knew, knew really knew much about the orcs, except for, of course, some people that we'll bring up later. Yes, yes. Uh, now you got to keep in mind while Corlin began to build himself an army of space marines, the orcs of the beast had set their eyes on Holy Terra and began their slow flight across the stars to reach the center of mankind. Now, surely at such a desperate time, the high lords of Terra would put aside their differences for the sake of humanity, right? 
<sighs> Sadly, no. These men's hearts have been filled to the brim with blackened greed. And the tensions between the bickering high lords of Terra threatened the stability of the Senatorium Imperialis and hampered the Imperium's war effort against the massive orc Rog. During this time, Inquisitor Representative Margaret Wynand was forced to bring her considerable influence and might of the Ordos of the Inquisition to bear, forcing Lord High Admiral Lansung to take immediate action against the orcs. Utilizing her inquisitorial agents that had been secretly inserted into the Imperial fleet, they were able to exploit the rivalry between Admiral Price and Krizil Akiaria, convincing the latter to attempt to take his portions of Lansung's fleet anchored in the Lepidus Prime and attempt to relieve the belingered Imperial forces that were being besieged by the Greenskins at Port Sanctus. Now, before I carry on here real quick, uh, Yuxin, by any chance, could you just give us a little bit of a description anyways of what Inquisitors are, how they work in, in the Imperium? So... Inquisition is basically oh remember I did say make it brief. <laughs> yeah. I know that's gonna be hard, but you think you could do it? They're kind of like the secret agents. Well, kind of secret, not necessarily. Their whole point is to generally root out evil or problems that are occurring inside of the Perium. And basically, they have authority that outranks the military. Okay. So they're kind of... They're like maybe, oversight. Right. They're oversight. So they're kind of like, in Terran 42's, the CIA, but they've got an army. That's well, probably the best way to describe they're it. able to execute whoever they want. And... <laughs> so, okay. So they're like the CIA with an army, but they're also like the Russian commissars. Something like that? <laughs> it's hard to explain briefly. We'll just go okay. with that for now. Okay. Later, okay. we will cover the Inquisition. We will actually, yes, we'll cover, uh, cover the Inquisition, but just not today. We just needed to give a little bit of a, an understanding for those who don't know what the Inquisition is. Um, every time I think of the Inquisition, though, I think of uh, uh, Mel Brooks's uh, <laughs> History of the World, Part 1. The Inquisition, what a treat. The Inquisition. Anyways. <laughs> Where was I? Oh, yes. Uh, <clears throat> Exploiting Admiral Akaria's lust for glory, the Admiral agreed to the Inquisitorial Agent's overtures. However, once the Lord High Admiral received word of what was transpiring amongst his senior officers, he did not wish to display an inability to command. Therefore, Lansung also departed with a large segment of Battle Fleet Solar, in order to personally lead the attack on the orcs at Port Sanctus. To compound matters, after the Lord High Admiral departed, the Puritan Lord Inquisitor Veritas launched a political coup within the Inquisition. He then forced Wynand to fake her death and go into hiding, effectively becoming the new Inquisitorial representative. Veritas was determined to force the remaining High Lords into a subordinate role to the Inquisition in order to successfully enact his plans. Despite the appearance of conflicting agenda between Veritas and the Lord High Admiral Lansung, the astute Draken Vangrick suspected that the two High Lords are somehow in league with one another. As you can see, this political intrigue is getting in the way of what's far more important. A giant green hurricane heading in their direction. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> now... Upon the arrival of Lansung's fleet, the remaining elements amounting to half the Segmentum fleet that survived the Greenskin onslaught rallied around Lord High Admiral Lansung and the Admirals Price and Akaria. The Imperial fleet then launches a desperate attack against the Orc Attack Moon and its accompanying Greenskin fleet that was besieging the vitally important Imperial shipyards. After weeks of intense fighting between the two opposing fleets, it soon became readily apparent that the Imperial forces, that they were outmatched and would ultimately be defeated if they did not withdraw immediately. The Orcs' surprising ability to have small raider-sized vessels rapidly teleport Orc warriors aboard Imperial vessels, despite having their void shields up, proved especially troubling. But due to their overriding urges to fight in close melee assault, and perhaps a lack of discipline, the Orc fleet eventually began to dissipate in order to pursue individual elements of the remaining Imperial fleet. Sensing an opportunity, 
the Imperial fleet launched a desperate attack against the attack moon, or die in the attempt, in order to halt its destructive presence once and for all. Though the near-suicidal assault against the orc attack moon proved costly to the Imperial fleet, the devastating barrage launched by the remaining Imperial naval vessels degraded the attack moon's void shields, which allowed for the Imperial forces to combine their firepower in conjunction with the suicidal attack by smaller Imperial attack craft directly inside the massive artificial station. With the destruction of the attack moon's gravitic generators, the entire structure of the artificial sphere exploded spectacularly. Yet, tragically, the resulting explosion took many of the surviving Imperial vessels along with it. The siege of Port Sanctus was finally lifted and the first of the orc attack moons had been destroyed. Lord High Admiral Lansung returned to the throne world in triumph as he was celebrated in a massive triumphant parade. But this premature victory celebration was short-lived. As another orc attack moon materialized in orbit over the throne world itself. Now you must be wondering where reinforcements were coming from. After all, this is holy terror, right? Well, unfortunately, the beast controlled a law the Imperium had never seen before nor since. Indeed. The massive greenskin horde was so large, in fact, they had begun to attack all quadrants of the Imperium. Wherever there was a human world, the orcs were attacking it. Truly, all corners of the Imperium and every segmentum saw heavy fighting against the seemingly unstoppable tide of the beast's greenskin tide. Yes. Even the Imperial worlds of the Prandium and Quantarn in the realm of Ultramar were invaded, forcing the Ultramines and several of their successor chapters to take defensive roles. This left them unable to assist the rest of the Imperium. Now remember, the Ultramarines and their successor chapters accounted for half the Adeptus Astartes. This in and itself was a huge blow to the rest of the Empire. Meanwhile, the Iron Hand sent three whole companies to assist Terra, while their fellow first founding chapters, which included the Salamanders, Space Wolves, and Raven Guard, were too bogged down fighting their own separate campaigns against the forces of the Beast, leaving them unable to come to the aid of Terra as well. However, the heroic and noble Blood Angels achieved some small victory, successfully destroying an orc attack moon in the Bale system. Yippee. <laughs> well, it was fairly impressive. Remember, it took three combined fleets of Imperial Navy to take down one of these moons. True, I'm not trying to take away the great feat of the Blood Angels. It's just that it was such a small drop in a huge bucket. Fair enough. Yep, yeah, yeah, back on Terra. The arrival of the orc attack moon caused widespread panic amongst the population. The Adeptus Arbites struggled to contain the massive waves of riots that erupted across the throne world. And in the anarchy and chaos, thousands of innocents died. The High Lords themselves were barricaded within the secure areas in the Imperial Palace to ensure their safety and security. To make matters worse, all contact was lost with the Martian priesthood on Mars, as Fabricator General Kubik refused to send aid to Terra. Keep this in mind. We'll get to this momentarily. Yes. Well, well, anyways, when the majority of the battle fleet solar deployed elsewhere or destroyed during the Battle of Port Sanctus, Terra was now left virtually defenseless. This left Lansung disgraced, as the former Lord High Admiral fell out of favor and lost position within the Senatorium Imperialis. It was at that moment the desperate plan emerged, concocted by Jeskina Tull the Speaker of the Chartist Captains, and the Ecclesiarch Mesring of the Ecclesiarchy. They proposed to launch a proletarian crusade, comprised of millions of fraternist militia forces. Who? Uh, oh, um, yeah. <laughs> they, they actually don't exist anymore in the Imperium. Think, um, psycho monks. That's probably the best way to describe them. Uh, <laughs> they're like... Uh, you know who the flatulents are? Or flat flagellants? Yeah. They're kind of like that, but they're also significantly more aggressive. It's whenever the ecclesiarchy, anyways, needs to push somebody around, they normally send these guys because they're completely and utterly insane and they're just completely and utterly devoted to the ecclesiarchy. They'll do anything that the ecclesiarch will ask. They're nuts. Okay. 
Right. Well, anyways, not just them, though, and Imperial civilian volunteers in support of the remaining Austrian military regiments and Adeptus Arbites. Though many notable high lords, including Vangerish, Veritas, and Lanson, condemned the plan as sheer madness, they were overruled by the ascendant speaker for the Chartist captain in the Ecclesiarch. The commencement of this crusade took place shortly after its announcement. Thousands of civilian voidcraft of all types were launched towards the orc attack moon in Terra's orbit. Orc fighters and boarding parties sustained heavy casualties as millions of Imperial Crusaders, Austro Militarum troopers, and Adeptus Arbite forces launched their desperate attack upon the attack moon. Due to the immense size of this makeshift fleet, the Imperials were able to punch through the orc's defenses and successfully land millions of troops upon the surface of the attack moon. They were even able to land a few hundred Lehman Rust tanks, as well as a number of chimeras and hellhounds in support. They were soon engaged in vicious battle with a large force of attacking greenskins. The Imperials were able to drive back the orcs through their sheer numbers and brutal close assault fighting. However, at their moment of triumph, the Imperial forces were utterly annihilated when the orcs manipulated the planetoid's surface crushing the invading Imperial forces by enclosing mountains. Okay. The best way to picture this is if you have, for example, a book, and you close the book. <laughs> On an ant that's scurrying across. On an the ant that's scurrying across. <laughs> and then you open it. And there it is. <laughs> Just a <Quite> gooey bad. mess. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That <clears throat> was basically what happened to the Imperials. Yeah. Which is significantly more sad than squishing an ant, but I digress. <laughs> Following the disaster of the proletarian crusade, the throne world faced destruction at the hands of the encroaching orcs. Seemingly out of options, an unforeseen event took place when a surviving crusade vessel landed upon Terra's surface. Three orcs, including an ambassador, emerged from within. The Imperials identified these orcs as an entirely new subset of advanced evolved beast orcs, similar to their infamous warlord. The ambassador, identifying himself as Bezrak, amazingly spoke Gothic and managed to arrange a meeting with the Senatorium Imperials, thanks to the efforts of Vangarich. The orc ambassador demanded that Terra surrender or face inevitable death. Left speechless, the High Lords were unable to give the Orc Ambassador any kind of coherent response. Disgusted by the human's cowardice and apparent lack of resolve, the Orc Ambassador took his leave and departed Terra. Yet all hope was not lost. For just after the departure of the Orc Ambassador, the chapters of The Last Wall arrived in system. This powerful combined fleet of the Imperial Fist's successor chapters were comprised of 20 battle barges, and strike cruisers carrying 2,800 battle brothers from the Black Templar, Crimson Fists, Excoriators, and Fist Exemplar chapters. The newly arrived fleet emerged directly above the Orc Attack Moon in Terra's orbit, led by High Marshal Bohemond of the Black Templars and Chapter Master Corlin, the last surviving Imperial Fist to start is. The Space Marines were finally able to finagle aid from the reluctant Martian priesthood. Faced by such a powerful force, Fabricator General Kubik agreed to assist the Last Wall fleet by sending a fleet of Basilicon Astra, five regiments of Skatari, and seven cohorts of the Legio Cybernetica. Once their forces were consolidated, the combined Imperial fleet launched an assault against the attack moon. Utilizing cyclonic torpedoes, they were able to disable most of the weapons on the attack moon's surface. However, the orcs were still able to utilize their deadly gravitic whip technology and managed to inflict several losses on the imperial forces with the orcs preoccupied with the attacking fleet the last wall chapters and their mechanicus allies launched a near simultaneous attack on the attack moon's surface these forces were comprised of the chapters veteran elite arrayed in deadly terminator armor supported by battle tanks borne by several thunderhawk transports alongside their deadly skatari allies and formidable battle automata and Legio Cybernetica. The Imperial forces were soon engaged in an all-out pitched battle against thousands of orcs. During the fighting, the Void battle slowly turned in the Greenskins' favor due to their devastating gravitic whip ability. 
but this was soon overcome by the timely arrival of the Iron Knights chapter, which quickly turned the tide of battle. Successfully disabling the Attack Moon's teleportation portal, the Greenskids could no longer receive reinforcements. With a large portion of the Attack Moon's surface left in shambles, the exhausted Imperial forces made a hasty tactical withdrawal. In the closing stages of the epic battle, the Iron Knight's chapter master, Alphonse, sacrificed himself to cover the escape of the fleeing Imperial forces as he fought a massive orc war boss the size of a dreadnought. In the battle's aftermath, a tense meeting was held between the last wall chapter masters and the Lord Commander of the Imperium, Udin Max Udo, who had audaciously claimed credit for the Imperial victory against the orcs. The Lord Commander then proceeded to scold the Astartes, claiming that the unification of the Imperial Fist successor chapters into allegiance forces was borderline heretical. He also condemned them for their unannounced arrival over the throne world and ordered the chapter masters to break up their fleets immediately. Udo also ordered that the destruction of the Imperial Fist be kept from general public. As to countenance, such a disaster would be unthinkable and the masses of Terra would devolve into outright panic. Most outlandish of all, the Lord Commander ominously demanded no further attacks would be made against the Orc Attack Moon, as Fabricator General Kubrick demanded it to remain intact for some unknown purpose. So they killed him for being an idiot, right? Right? Unfortunately, no. Uh. Though enraged by the impertinent and outrageous demands of the Lord Commander, Corlin cautioned his brothers to maintain the Emperor's vision and to comply with the chairman of the Senatorium Imperialis. Meanwhile, at that exact moment on the world of Zelenek IV, the Black Templar's crusade force led by Marshal Magnaric and the Iron Warrior's warsmith Kalkator came to an uneasy truce, formating a tentative alliance in the face of a mutual threat of invading orcs. Now, this is interesting because for the first time in over 1,500 years, not since the bygone era of the Great Crusade had the sons of both Rogaldorn and Perturbo fought side by side. In the meantime, back on Terra, the outspoken High Marshal Bohemond expressed his disdain for both the squabbling and weak-willed High Lords of Terra, as well as the Lord Commander. After Lord Commander Udo passed a motion to ban the Inquisition from the Senatorium, Coraline finally had enough <laughs> and came to the realization that the squabbling and weak-willed High Lords proved too ineffective to achieve victory. The last son of Dorne personally led a political coup in cooperation with several members of the Senatorium Imperialis, including Grand Master of the Assassins, Vangaric, Inquisitor Representative Veritas, Lord Inquisition Wynand, and Grand Provost Marshal of the Adeptus Arbites, Vernal Zek. Realizing that he could not oppose Corlan, the rest of the High Lords eventually fell in line and unanimously approved the Imperial Fist Chapter Master, appointed as the newly instilled Lord Commander of the Imperium. Now, you might be asking, what happened to uh, Udo? Um, and and unfortunately, <laughs> you can see what you know. <laughs> Well, he didn't. He didn't die here, though. That's the sad part. He should have, but he didn't. I, I'm guessing that Van Grick, over time, decided to just remove him. I uh, yeah, I th yeah, I kind of agree with you. But anyways, um, what happens next, Yuxin? Well, next, as his first act as Lord Commander of the Imperium, Corland moved to curtail the scheming of the Martian priesthood. It had come to light that the Mechanicus were secretly experimenting with orc teleportation technology in the hopes of teleporting the Red Planet away from the Soul System. An order from the newly instilled Lord Commander Corland, a force of Astartes from the Fist Exemplar, commanded by their chapter master Maximus Thane, was dispatched to Mars to take Tech Priest Urquidex into custody. But upon landing on the surface of the Red Planet, they were confronted by a large force of Skitari, Electro Priests, and Battle Automata of the Legio Cybernetica, under the command of the senior artisan Argus von Aachen. The senior artisan did not wish to engage the Stardes, 
and attempted to impede the Stardi's pro uh, progress with his own Skatari forces, ordering them to leave Mars immediately. Though engaged in a terse standoff, Chapter Master Thane continued his advance upon Pavanus Mons, where Urquidex was being held. He refused to let his progress be impeded, but was careful not to engage the Mechanicus forces, provoking them unnecessarily. However, despite the effort of the commanders of both sides not to engage one another, disaster struck when an errant shot from a Onager Doom Crawler accidentally struck an incoming Fist Exemplar drop pod. Both sides immediately engaged one another in intense but thankfully brief firefight. It was only through the supreme efforts of Fabricator General Kubik, who is currently on Terra, that a complete massacre was averted, thanks to Corlin's impassioned speech to the Fabricator General about unifying in the face of the nearly unstoppable Greenskin's menace. Fabricator General was finally swayed to the Imperium's cause. Kubik immediately ordered his forces on Mars to stand down. They quickly complied with the wishes of the supreme commander of the Mechanicus. The Fist Exemplar then took Urquidex into custody. Gleaning knowledge from the now half-servitor Urquidex, the Lord Commander learned the location of the beast's homeworld, Ulanor, hmm. the same place that Horus was named Warmaster. Yes, and if you want to know more about that, check out my short box on the Ulanor Crusade. Indeed, but like I was saying, Corlands quickly dispatched a call to arms across the Imperium to gather at Terra in order to launch an Imperial Crusade towards the fabled planet and destroy the Beast, as well as finally dealing a fatal blow to the crippled attack moon that remained in orbit above Terra. The Blood Angels, Dark Angels, Space Wolves, and the Ultramarines all heeded the call and made their way towards the throne world of humanity. Now, following this successful coup, Inquisitorial Representative Veritas informed now Lord Commander Corland of valuable information that could potentially drastically change the outcome of the War of the Beast. The lost Primarch of the Salamander's Legion, Vulcan, had been rediscovered upon the world of Caldera, waging a one-man war against the green-skinned hordes of the Beast. Now, if you want to know more about this, check out our Vox, Where's Vulcan? We were running on a deadline, so how about we just move ahead with the first Battle of Ulanor? Sure, but I do wish to note that when Vulcan returned to Holy Terra, he only scolded the High Lords instead of purging them for the sake of unity. Which to me means that the thought of purging the High Lords of Terra was in his mind. No doubt because of Corlin. Now, brother, why don't you give a countenance of the first Battle of Ulanor? Of course, but unfortunately, we are out of time for this, Fox. But don't worry, friends. We will release the second part as the same time as their part one. We just figured that we should break it up a little bit. Good thinking, Zektar. Well, before we take off, perhaps we tie this together with our thoughts. Yeah, and I actually do have a question. Um... <laughs> Uh, why do you think the Vulcan actually didn't purge the, <laughs> the High Lords of Terra? This would have been like a perfect time for him to do that. We could have gotten rid of well, those. Actually, those lords. no, it wouldn't have been the perfect time because they're about to head out to fight. That's the whole point. Because eh. if they did do that, then there, it would be kind of like, for example, killing off the head of an orc group. Sadly enough. It'd be the same sort of impact. All of a sudden, there'd be all this scrambling for who's going to be at the top. Speaking of which, anyways, what do you think of the ambassador? To me, that's really interesting. I just find it funny that the ambassador... Well, I find it interesting that the ambassador was even allowed in. But, yeah, uh, I hear you. I'm, I'm kind of wondering if... Van Grick thought it'd just be humorous to allow him in to begin with. Because I have no doubt that he's smart enough, he knew what was going to happen, that they're going to say, no, we can't do that. 
Well, was so, it, the funny I, part I is, just have this twisted sense of, I can have them seeing this somewhat twisted sense of humor of going, I want to see what happens with these people when they're faced with this ambassador. Right. <laughs> and what he has to say. <laughs> oh, so you're saying anyways, you think anyways that he let the, um, the ambassador in just simply because he wanted to kind of purvey the room anyways. And I think he knew that basically, okay, you have an ambassador from an invading country coming in. And you got to know that he knows that no matter what the ambassador says, the Imperium's just going to say no. Well, I think it's even worse than that. I mean, you're thinking of like an invading country coming in. This is like... Remember, anyways, humanity does not think kindly of the orcs. In fact, they think of them as rather stupid and, and just these bumbling greenskins, anyways, that become massive mobs that, that are a hindrance to humanity. Right. Never once have they ever thought of, anyways, as intelligent creatures. So, <laughs> which is why I think that I wouldn't be surprised if it was a bit of twisted humor that. Well, and curiosity, but I think also there there's a little bit of... I agree with the curiosity part, yeah. I, I, I can see somebody, though, having a little bit of a twisted sense of humor of going, you know, I've hated these people that I've been working with. <laughs> I'd find it kind of humorous to see how they're going to react to this ambassador. <laughs> Perhaps we yeah. ruffle a few feathers. Let's, let's listen to them. <laughs> I mean, come on. We got to listen to these guys. Although I will say anyways, once the orc starts talking, which by the way, you can find in um, a lot of this is actually chronicled by multiple different historians. Uh, and it's just simply titled The War of the Beast. Where the beast arises. Yeah. Uh, many uh, chroniclers such as Dan Abnett. Um, who are yeah, the other ones? Thorpe, Rob Sanders. Yeah. Uh, David Annandale. Maybe. <laughs> I want to say. But yeah, I, I will say this, though. The thing that I find interesting when this is chronicled, and and I've done the reading anyways on, on when this orc actually speaks, I think even the Grand Master of Assassins was just shocked at the decorum anyways of this orc. Yeah. I well, think it I, even I, shook I him to the core. that he was shocked about that. I just think, though, from a viewpoint... He was letting him in. Going, I, I'd be somewhat curious to see what this thing's going to say and also how other people are going to react to it. Um, I will say anyways, in one final note, I find it interesting um, how it's a lot of this anyways is a lot of a lot of these problems are, are actually humanity's problems. It's not the orcs, which is to me anyway. Political problems, which is even worse. Yeah. So here's, here's, I guess, here's my final question to you before we do actually have to take off, but don't worry anyways, the next one is coming up soon. I mean, it, it will be, by the time I release this one, the other one will be released like five minutes later. So <laughs> you won't oh. have the time. Yeah, we will have that upload. Unless you're watching this on YouTube and it might take a little bit longer. But if the Imperium had actually been set up and, and they were very regimented and everybody was running in the same direction, so to speak, anyways. Do you think, anyways, they would have had this... Uh, well, they wouldn't have had the same problems, but do you think, anyways, it would have... The War of the Beast would have been as much of a problem? I think it still would have been a, a major problem because, like... There's so many of them. You mentioned there were so many of them that wasn't just... Ex exclusively this one area right it was hitting everywhere uh but i do think that with a more slut solidified front they probably would have been able to handle things better at least when it came to for example arda mantua yeah and port sanctus yeah yeah um i will also mention anyways real quick anyways with the chromes <laughs> they're trying to escape something i find it funny that the imperium doesn't even think well what are they running from yeah and, by the way this isn't the first time this has happened and it's not the last time it happens either anyways where some weird race of aliens anyway seems like they're running from something and no one ever stops to go well what are they running from yeah <laughs> nobody does they just go 
well, this is a good opportunity to exterminate this group. <laughs> and then all of a sudden it's like, oh, what are those? Oh, it's the Tyranids, you know, <laughs> or, or yeah. in this particular situation, a giant massive wog of orcs, <laughs> you know, no one ever. No, even worse thing. than that, a giant planet sized. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But no one stops to think about that. They just kind of just like, oh, well, you know, they're running from something. We can go ahead and kill them. <laughs> no one ever stops to go, what are they running from? <laughs> well, folks, that's all the time we have on this recording. I hope you join us for the War of the Beast Part 2. Indeed. And if not, like always, <clears throat> this is Zekthar. And Yuxin, signing off.